Morning, everybody. Morning. <clears throat> this situated here. The uh, so when I, I I came in this morning, uh, Katie Ann asked me what have you been up to, and I'll tell you. I actually last night went to was part of a, a cooking class, and I check off another life skill of another ability I do not have. The uh, I cannot cook. I found that out last night. I thought that going in, and last night only confirmed it. Pretty sure if I was ever stranded on an island, I think I would probably die within three days, staring out at the ocean, wonder if my Uber Eats guy is going to show up. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think the, the fact that I'm Irish is a hindrance. I don't think there's a lot of great Irish chefs. There's not a lot of great Irish restaurants, right? I mean, that, that's a short book right there, Great Irish Restaurants. And if you think about, if you're, the, as far as like the, the if you're going to go out for, for dinner, right, maybe you're going to go for Italian, maybe you'll go to a French restaurant on your, your anniversary or something, maybe you do Chinese food. Does anybody ever say, let's go out for Irish? Like, that never happens. It's not good. <laughs> right? <laughs> Even like when people are out drinking late, well, they're going to go run to the border. They're going to go get bad Mexican at 2 in the morning. Rather than get boiled meat and warm beer at a at a you know Irish place, so the uh, and whoever thought that boiled meat and warm beer would be a good idea for like a food truck or a restaurant? That's just awful. We don't even have our own salad dressing. If you think about that, <laughs> let's continue on. I mean, even the Russians have their own salad dressing, <laughs> right? That's how bad Irish cooking is. So the. Uh, but that was a lot of fun. But again, I, another ability I do not have. The, uh, so I had a question come up this week, and I, I've heard this a few times lately, and it is a great question. It's a very basic question, but it, I find it to be fascinating to, to, to really dwell on. The question that came up this week, it's come up a few times, the question was this, why does it matter? We're talking about faith, why does it matter? Theology, why does it matter? What a great question. It really is. Like, why are you sitting in a bar on a Sunday morning? You came here. Some of you are visiting. Jack's visit, Jack and Karen are like, what in the world is this place? <laughs> right? Why does it matter? Is there anything to it? Are there any benefits? Is there anything at stake? You know the unbelieving world is asking that question themselves all the time. They probably think we're crazy. And I do think it matters. I think it matters greatly. Now, I came up through Campus Crusade. I was one of those Christian folks who really thought that, oh, I got a ticket out of hell into heaven. Like, that's it. When I die, it's going to be great. That's, an, that's a, that, your faith it's, it might start there. It shouldn't stop there. Right? I do believe that you make a decision. I do believe that you accept Christ. Right? I do believe that's, that's it's a, a point that... that we need at some time to deal with who is the most incredible person ever walked the planet. That's according to Time Magazine, not me. Jesus is the most fascinating person that's ever lived. What do you do with that? And that's where I do think bad theology has bad consequences. Or as Luke Dunnick will say sometimes, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Bad theology has consequences. And Jesus said, I came that they'd have life and have it abundantly. And some of you might know this about me, but there's oftentimes I yell at my radio. The reason I yell at my radio is bad theology. Bad theology that is not encouraging to the believers. And there's lots of it. There's lots of it. There is an incredible insecurity in the body of believers. A lot of us hear our parents, that's not what we want out of our kids. We want our kids to know we love them, that they're safe and secure. We want our kids to know that. Somehow we've turned Christianity to this behavior modification program or that now I, I, you know, I got out of hell into heaven, now I got to start doing some stuff for God. Well, I think as a parent's perspective, like we didn't have kids so somebody would cut the grass. We had kids so we could love them. They might love us back. 
but God is love. And it wasn't Elisha Silverstone or Silverstein, wasn't the first one to say as if, it was Luke in Acts. said God's not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. So I sit with men all the time, and my desire in life is to strip away this duty and obligation that we all put on ourselves. If I can strip away all the duty and obligation of your time and of your money, what's left is the core of you as a new creation to be molded by the Spirit, prompted to, I don't know what you're supposed to do, but if we can strip all that away, you can get some clarity as to what the Spirit is telling you to do. There's an abundant life to be had. And it doesn't mean you're going to shut it down. It doesn't mean you're not going to talk to folks or, or do things or volunteer or give to things. It doesn't mean that at all. But if we can strip away the duty and obligation, I think the Spirit can just be unleashed in our lives. I'm not Pentecostal, right? That's a whole other issue that I have, right? Some people are starting to bring back some of the gifts, and which, I'm sorry, it's just so absurd to me. You know, like the idea that you can go to a, a, a healing conference and they'll make your leg longer. Come on. Jesus, I'll make you fishers of men and a chiropractor, and we're going to help people whose inseam is a little shorter than the other one. He didn't say that. That's not what he said. But somehow we've, we've, we've meatballed this whole thing and made it very confusing to those of us in the body. And the outside world's like, what in the world is going on? So does it matter? I think it does matter. You know, and, and one thing in particular is salvation, right? John 3, 16, I think... All the denominations, we all have this in common, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We hold that in common, right? Also keep this in mind. When you accepted Christ, you were placed into Christ. I know you've heard me mention this ratio before. There's a 10 to 1 ratio in Scripture about you being in Christ versus Christ in you. It is great news that Christ is in you, but there's a 10 to 1 ratio about you being in Christ. So if you were in Christ, when Jesus was on the cross, where were you? In Christ. If Jesus was there at the foundation of the world, where were you at the foundation of the world? In Christ. Boy, that, answer, that, comes, that answers a lot of theological questions right there. A lot of what's taken over our seminaries and our churches. You are in Christ. Dwell on that. Let that marinate in your mind and what that means and the implications of that. It's great news. It's very good news. There's another verse, the, the uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. There are 60 verses, 60 verses that say you're a saint. 60. And what do we like to say? I'm nothing but a dirty. There's 60 verses that say you're a saint. I'm not saying we're perfect in our behavior, but your behavior doesn't dictate your identity. Your behavior didn't get you into Christ. I'll add to that, your behavior doesn't get you out of Christ. You've been placed in Christ, right? And that's where, again, I, you know, I, I want you to, the reason, out of all those verses, the reason I picked this one out of, out of Corinthians, because the town of Corinth, Maggie and I were talking about this yesterday, Corinth was a port town. What I picture is Jack Sparrow hanging out in Corinth, right? It's a pirate's town. It was nuts. He called them saints. The people that were there, the believers in Christ there, he called them saints. Just picture, I mean, it was like pirates of the Caribbean. It was a port, crazy port town. Saints. Saints. And forgiveness is dictated by your spiritual birth, not your behavior. Again, behavior doesn't get you into Christ. Behavior doesn't get you out of Christ. 
the consistency of Scripture all the way through is amazing to me. Always about faith. Genesis all the way to Revelation. So does salvation matter? It does. And if there's one thing that I would love ministers to do that are out there teaching, at least give people the, their security. At the very least, at the very least, don't impress them with your theology. At the very least, encourage my brethren, my brothers and sisters, encourage them that they're safe and secure. You're good. There's that one verse that we'll hear a lot, a lot of times at funerals is, you know, the, 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 about the talents, right? And what does he say to these people with the talents? Well done, good and faithful servant. Why is it we hear that at funerals? We don't often say this to one another. We hear it at funerals. Because in that story, when Jesus told that story, those people weren't dead. They weren't dead when he told them that. They were alive and well. I think the Spirit is saying that to you all the time. And we're always measuring ourselves and our behavior and I woulda, coulda, shoulda. And Jesus is always about right now. It's about now. He wants us to have this abundant life now. So you're forgiven. And your forgiveness, your forgiveness is safe and secure. And I, th that is, I, I just, if there's anything, um, just own that. Know that. Talking about security, the, uh, uh, the security of the believer. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. I think a lot of times you like, you'll hear people say, well, I'm not perfect. This verse says you're perfect. I'm not saying your behavior is perfect. Right? Trying to separate our behavior from our identity. Who you are, again, who you are in Christ, you've been perfected. You're good to go. Right? When were you perfected? When you accepted Christ. Some of you here uh, have been through the Roman study. Bob Warren you know, wrote that years ago. It's had a great impact on, on many of us here. Um, Bob has, has since passed. But when Bob used to call me on my cell phone, when you'd see Bob's name come up on your phone, it was like, it's like a kid when, it's like Batman's calling. It's like, how cool is this? Answer, I couldn't wait to talk to him. Bob called me once, I'll never forget this, I was actually down in Evansville, and he was so excited the night before, he felt like he just got in a moment, almost like a download from the Spirit in a moment, in a real challenging, challenging question. This person pushing back on him about, oh, you're an Arminian, you believe that your faith got you and gets you out all this, and you know, this, you're hokey pokey, you're, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. And Bob said, Matt, I, I, in that moment I asked him, I said, how did you enter Christianity? And this gentleman said, by faith. And Bob said, what keeps you? The guy said, faith. I said, no, you're kept by Christ. You are kept by Christ. It's a covenant relationship, it's not a contract. This is not a contract. This is not a pay-to-play contract. You entered a covenant relationship. And why does God hate divorce? Because it's not a picture of his relationship with us. It happens, like Danny mentioned in prayer time. It happens. But why does God hate it? Because it's not a picture of what it's real, his relationship is like. And what a marriage is supposed to be like. And you've heard me say this before, that it's... It's an inverted triangle, right? It's not, a, it's, not an org, it's not a corporate org chart. It's inverted. Christ is the foundation. And man, I'll say this. We've been called to a, a deeper calling. We've been called to a deeper level of submission over our wives. I believe that. Husbands, love your wives the way that Christ loves the church. That's deeper than what she's been called to. Men, if you're married, if you're dating, know that. Be in it for what she gets out of it. I don't expect the world to understand this. And I think there's a lot of bad Christian counseling out there that they talk as if marriage counseling is almost like these two dogs nose to nose and they're, they're just watching one another to see if the other one's behaving. That's not Christianity. That's not marriage. That's not a relationship. 
Men, you've been called to a deeper calling of submission. Christ is the foundation. You love her the way Christ loves the church. It doesn't mean someone breaks in the house, you're going to protect her. It means so much more than that. You be enough for what she gets out of it. I tell you, ladies, if you have a husband or a boyfriend who understands that, this, that, that relationship can just be like nuclear fission, just a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Because I think the power source of that relationship then is of God. Not just trying to hack your way through this life. You've got a power source that is that's unending. And glory to God for that. The uh, to, to three. The uh, identity principles. The uh, this is to again going back to the original question of why does it matter? Understand who you are in Christ. Understand some identity principles. I love talking to people about this. This is one in particular I think is worth memorizing. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think it'll help you sleep. So there's not just spiritual benefits. I think that there's some physical benefits as well, too. And I know, and that's one thing I would tell you. When you stand up here and I see these faces, I know a lot of the testimonies. I know a lot of the hurt. I know the grief. I know the finances. I know, I know a lot of what's going on here. And I'm not, and do not hear I'm saying that Christianity is walking the park. It's not. It's not, right? We all know that, right? Sometimes our circumstances are awful. Right? Sometimes expectations on others, we get let down. Sometimes our chemicals get out of whack, right? There's physical impacts, right, to this world. We're stuck in these bodies. But I do think one in particular, if you're beating yourself up about the past, woulda, coulda, shoulda, I messed that up. This is a great verse to keep in mind. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So use your discernment. When you hear that thought come into your mind, just crumple that up like a piece of paper. That's not of God. I think the Spirit's always directing you where you should go. Always directing us where we should go. Use your discernment. When you, that condemnation starts coming at you, t- tune in on your discernment and just recognize that, that that's a lie. Another verse, the uh, actually I think it's 2 Corinthians, Jim, isn't it? Yeah. The, uh, so Rusty is, Rusty's actually, I'll uh, be teaching this next week. So Rusty, I'm sorry to take, I think, the greatest verse out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person's a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You're a new creation. You're not who you were. You're a new creation. You're a new being, right? The same body, right? But you've been changed, Right? When you read scripture, you can see that, that there's a lot in like Leviticus and other places that you'll see. There's talk about the cleansing of the temple. Your temple's been cleansed. The Holy Spirit's moved in. So when Hebrews 10, 14 says you're, you've been perfected, absolutely have to be perfected. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit now would not be able to move in. Right? You're a new creation. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't change. Again, he's got you. He's got hold of you. The fourth thing up here, Jim, is walk by the Spirit. Uh, But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Right? This is just us on a day-to-day basis, right? You can walk by the flesh. So when that question comes up, why does it matter? I think a lot of the unbelieving world, like, well, Christians look like, look like, you know, her- they look like heretics to me. You know, they're, they're I'm sorry, hypocrites. They look like hypocrites, right? That I think a lot of the, the kids maybe don't want what we're, we're, we're talking to them. We have a freedom. We are free to choose. 
You are free to walk by the flesh. But what do you get out of that? You get the fruit of the flesh. Anger, <laughs> outbursts of anger, fighting, this. It's awful. Or you can walk by the Spirit and you get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. This is what everybody wants. The only people that have access to the fruit of the Spirit are those people who are in Christ. But those people who are in Christ still can choose to walk by the flesh. But don't be surprised what you get out of walking by the flesh. Right? You reap what you sow. You walk by the flesh, that's what you're going to get. We've been given freedom. We've been given a free will. Choose wisely. You don't have to walk by the Spirit. You get to. And that's a privilege that we have. I want to close out with this, is that when you understand who you are in Christ, right? Be encouraged. You be encouraged. There's a, right, there's a dialogue going on in your head. Be encouraged. Let it be positive. Be encouraged, right? When, if you're ever on an airplane, you know what they say is that in the case of an emergency, when the mask comes down, what do they say? Put your mask on first. Put your mask on first. Especially when I see a lot of the mothers out here. You poured so much time into the kids, and we're all grateful for that. But moms, be careful of the dialogue in your head, and look out for yourself too. Spiritually, beware of that dialogue in your head. Let it be positive, because there are impacts, and it will impact us physically. It can impact the chemical re re reactions in our brain. It can. Put your mask on first. Understand who you are in Christ. Understand that security that you have. And then encourage others. <clears throat> you know, when I think back to things like World War II or World War I, maybe guys, boys, we think about war situations more often. I think about being in a foxhole with somebody, and I think now that these people in the foxhole are younger than my son who's 20 years old. 18 years old in a foxhole in France or somewhere. And you're 18 years old, you gotta be terrified. Man, we gotta encourage one another. It doesn't necessarily, or nobody, we don't all, we don't get out of this alive, right? At some point this thing ends. But we're in this foxhole together, right? And let's encourage one another. And be positive. Daughter Maggie was saying this to me yesterday. Was, we were discussing this. She said, if your glass is empty, you can't pour into others. If your glass is empty, you can't pour into others. Be full. Be overflowing. You should be. Because you're in Christ. A friend of mine's dad passed away a couple weeks ago, and I sent him a text. And this is just, I mean this to, to all of you. If you need someone to sit and listen, if you need someone to sit there and talk, if you need someone to sit there, drink coffee and listen, drink coffee and talk, to drink beer and listen, drink beer and talk, I mean, count me in. Absolutely count me in. I'm with you, I'm for you. There's so many of you here that are just a great encouragement to me and others around it, one another here. But sometimes we get distracted. This world is very distracting, work's very distracting, family's very distracting. I listen to the old Andy Williams song, that, uh, the Christmas song. It's a wonderful time of the year. Is it? Not for everybody. Right? Sometimes it can be a stressful time of the year. And th that's where, again, just keep in mind that, that you know, that this is, beware of the dialogue going on in your own mind. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close with this, is that this dialogue as well, 
remember that Jesus called you a friend. And sometimes I used to teach this to, to the kids is that God just doesn't like you. I mean, he just doesn't love you. He also likes you. He gets you. He understands your sense of humor. Danny, he even understands your sense of humor. <laughs> he loves you and he likes you. Please, if you get a chance, at some point today, you can close your mind and really just, just picture this. Jesus holding your face and telling you, you're good. You're good. You're doing great. And him saying this to you as well, too. Please enjoy me. I so enjoy you. Please enjoy me. Don't work for me. Don't do things for me. Just enjoy me. Things will happen. Beautiful things will happen. But see that dialogue with Christ and know that he's absolutely for you. So why does it matter? Because, and this is what frustrates me, when you misrepresent God's character to people, it hurts people. It makes me mad. So the energy that I have to do a message like this comes from a frustration that I have. I like to call it a righteous anger, right? I've got a meme, the, uh, a cartoon. The, I don't know if you all will be able to see this, but the uh, Jesus in the temple. If anyone ever asks you, what would Jesus do? Remind him that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is within the realm of possibilities. <laughs> if the teaching is not encouraging for you to further understand for you to further pursue God's heart. And get off the radio. Sit down. Turn the microphone off. Go home. Go sit and listen. There's a lot of people here that, I, that understand God's character far better than people with global ministries that I hear. And there's a, Jim, can you put up that laser light show? That one. Um, I, I want you all to see this. Only because one way to pursue God's heart, I would say, is Scripture. This here is a cross-reference. There's over 63,000 cross-references in Scripture. Every one of these little white lines down here is a representation of a chapter in the Bible. This is Genesis 1 all the way down here. This is Revelation 22 all the way down here. There's over 63,000 cross-references in Scripture. A lot of times we get stuck in the Gospels. Well, if you don't know the Old Testament, you really can, I'm sorry, you can't understand the Gospels. So a lot of times we might say, well, I don't, I don't really know the Old Testament. I'd love to talk to you about the Old Testament. It's fascinating. And the consistency of Scripture all the way through. And types and anti-types and how these things, they, all, they come up again and again and again. Right? You, you read the book of Romans, well, you, you got to know the Bible to read Romans. It's not just about, it's not just there. There's cross-references all over the place. So scripture is a way to do that, how to get to know God's heart. And I think what you'll find is when we put our nose in the book or our app or our phone, wherever you have your, your, your Bible, what you'll see in the Bible is God is for you, absolutely for you. So why does it matter? Because there's way too many discouraged Christians out there. That's why it matters. And I would hope that everybody would leave here encouraged of who you are in Christ, what Christ did for you, all the glory to God. Jesus said there's an abundant life to be had. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be tears and hurt. But for the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. Clearly, happiness and joy cannot be the same. Right? What does that mean? 
So I hope that you are encouraged today. I know that this world can be, can be distracting. I think a lot of teaching out there can be very discouraging. My only hope today is that you would leave here encouraged about what Christ did and what he's doing in our lives today. With that, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you have accomplished and what you are accomplishing. And Lord, we, uh, we just pray that we keep our focus on today. Not sure what the future has in hold. There's no peace in the future. There's no peace in the past. But in this high eye of this hurricane that we call life, we know that there's an eye of this storm, that there is peace and blue sky in this storm that was raging around each and every one of us. Lord, we get distracted. You know that. And we pray that you bring to each and every one of us the peace that passes all understanding. This peace on earth, goodwill to men, and peace in our minds. And Lord, I just pray that you are glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very good. Yeah.